We're going to be back in Matthew 24. And we're uh, only going to cover a few verses again today. Uh, but I think that uh, these verses are important for us to take some time with because if you start reading about these passages and looking at commentaries on these passages, there are all kinds of opinions and ideas about these a uh, few verses we're going to look at today. And so uh, we want to give them some time and, and look at them in the context of what's going on and, and, and understand what, what Jesus is saying in these verses. And so remember, uh, coming into chapter 24, Jesus is responding to the disciples. They've asked him a question because they believe it's already the end of the age. Uh, they, they, they believe they were living through the tribulation with Rome the Messiah has come and now it's time for the kingdom they thought that it was, it was upon them right then and there and so they asked Jesus tell us when will these things be and what will be the sign of your coming and of the end of the age and so this chapter is Jesus answering that question that they've asked really those questions uh, when will these things be and will be the sign of the end of the age? He, he's, asking, he's answering the question they asked. So we have to keep that in mind when we're uh, understanding some of these figurative things Jesus is talking about here, some of this language about the fig tree and the other things we're going to see this morning. But they asked him a question and he's responding to that. And he's told them, we've already seen, that there would be birth pain increasing and increasing up to the end. There'll be wars and famines and earthquakes. Uh, Luke 21 includes pestilences and signs in the heavens. And Jesus said that that was going to be increasing and increasing. And then there'd be another thing that would happen, Jesus said, kind of a big sign of uh, the dead giveaway would be the abomination of desolation spoken of by the prophet Daniel. And we spent some time there and looked at Daniel a few weeks ago and uh, to understand the abomination of desolation that Paul also describes. Uh, Paul's description in the New Testament helps us a little bit with that in 2 Thessalonians 2. Now concerning the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ and our being gathered together to Him, we ask you, brothers, not to be quickly shaken in mind or alarmed, either by a spirit or a spoken word, or a letter seeming to be from us to the effect that the day of the Lord has come. Let no one deceive you in any way, for that day will not come, unless the rebellion comes first, and the man of lawlessness is revealed, the son of destruction, who opposes and exalts himself against every so-called God or object of worship, so that he takes his seat in the temple of God, proclaiming himself to be God. We've looked at that, the abomination of desolation and the Antichrist setting himself up in the temple, and we know that He's going to come, uh, the Antichrist, and he's going to establish himself as a ruler. Uh, ultimately, he's going to claim to be God, and that's going to take place over three and a half years. We looked at that quite a bit last week uh, and the week before in Daniel and Revelation. And in Matthew 24, uh, we've looked at verses 15 through 28, where Jesus said, during the time of the Antichrist, he's ruling on the earth three and a half years, it's going to be incredible persecution for the Jewish people and Christians and anybody that won't bow down to the Antichrist. Incredible persecution, Jesus said. And then, last week we saw that the heavens are going to be shaken and Christ is going to come back on the clouds in power and great glory. And so we've been looking at him answering this question. It's a very thorough answer. He's giving them a very detailed answer. When is this going to happen? What is, this, what is the end of the age? What are the signs of your coming? And he's given us a whole chapter of very detailed answers uh, and kind of the, the timeline of, of these things that are going to be happening and increasing. It's going to get really, really bad. And then he's going to come back in power and great glory. And today we pick up in verse 32. Matthew 24, 32 through 35. If you're able, if you would, please stand. For the reading of the word of God. Matthew 24, beginning in verse 32. Jesus says, From the fig tree learn its lesson. As soon as its branches become tender and puts out its fruit, or its leaves, you know that summer is near. 
So also, when you see all these things, you know that he is near at the very gates. Truly, I say to you, this generation will not pass away until all these things take place. Heaven and earth will pass away, but my words will not pass away. Dear Lord, we come before you this morning again and just want to ask that you would bless the reading of your word and help us to understand your word today. And Lord, that maybe where we have concerns in our life about your control, that, that we would understand that in these passages. Lord, maybe we have questions about the end of the age and we we'll just pray that we would as we look at your answer to the disciples about these things that we would have an understanding of these things too that it would edify us and equip us and encourage us as we do ministry together for your sake and, and as a church and in our homes with our families and in our everyday lives and we pray these things in your son's name amen, amen. you may be seated and so this is one of those topics where I've only been talking about it for a long time. And I, I'm talking to a couple of different people over the last few weeks and they're like, how's it going? And I say, well, oh, I feel like, I feel like we're just dredging through chapter 24. So I know you feel that way. But at the same time, this is one of those topics people want to talk about all the time, right? The end times and revelation and, and, and well, what's it all going to be like? And Jesus this is him himself giving us a very detailed explanation of the end of the age and his second coming. And we read last week from Acts chapter 1 about the ascension. And when he ascended into heaven, the, the two men standing there in white robes, we assume the angels, said, Men of Galilee, why do you stand looking into heaven? This Jesus, who is taken up from you into heaven, will come in the same way as you saw him go into heaven. And so we're excited about that. We want to talk about that. We have questions about that. Paul said to Titus in Titus chapter 2 that we're waiting for our blessed hope, the appearing of the glory of our, bright, our great God and Savior, Jesus Christ. And so this is an exciting thing. As much as we've spent a lot of time in this chapter, it should be an exciting thing, an encouraging thing to realize that but this is where our hope is going to be complete, really. We're going to be glorified when the, the, the kingdom is going to be established for eternity, right? The millennial reign and the kingdom and the new creation, the new heaven and the new earth. And it's an exciting thing. And so Paul says we're waiting for our blessed hope, which is what? It's the appearing of the glory of our great God and Savior, Jesus Christ. We look back to the cross where redemption was made possible through Christ, but we also look forward to the second coming when that redemption is going to be complete. That's the way Luke words it. We read that last week, Luke 21, 28. When you see these things begin to take place, Luke says, straighten up and raise your heads because your redemption is drawing near. And so Jesus is teaching us about that. In verses 32 through 35, Jesus gives an analogy. That's what this is. It's a parable. It's an analogy. And the purpose of parables, if you remember from Matthew 13, when the disciples asked Jesus, why are you teaching parables? And Jesus said, I do it to help you understand more fully, basically. I, I teach in parables to give you a better understanding or a more complete understanding of something I've already taught about. And so we're going to look at these passages today where Jesus takes a normal or practical example and uses it to teach something spiritual. Verse 32. From the fig tree, learn its lesson. Or your translation may say, learn this parable. As soon as its branch becomes tender and puts out its leaves, you know that summer is near. And we've talked about this before. Figs and fig trees were commonly used in a parabolic way to teach things. Even in the Old Testament, it's used all the time. Figs and fig trees and baskets of figs and to teach different lessons because they were so abundant in Israel. There's fig trees everywhere. And so it was a very easy thing that everybody understood because they were used to fig trees. But he's using something they're used to and he says, learn. From the fig tree, learn its lesson. 
It's something they're supposed to be able to understand. And I point that out because there are a whole lot of ideas out there about what these verses mean that make it impossible for the disciples to have been able to learn anything if it means what some people say it means. And I'll give you this. Some of these you may have heard before. There are some who try to make this whole chapter about 70 A.D. Now, some of it is. We've talked about that. The destruction of the temple coming down and all that. That part did happen. But it didn't all happen in 70 A.D. Some people try to say that it did and, and that this is all about that. But the problem was that this, these are all prophecies about the coming of the Son of Man, not the coming of Rome. That's who came in 70 A.D. into Jerusalem was Rome and tore things down. So the whole thing is not about that. It's about the future coming of Christ. Something else you maybe have heard, and I remember hearing this growing up a few times, was that the fig tree in this verse represents Israel and that the, the new branches or the new leaves happen, that, that represents Israel regaining statehood in 1948. And maybe you've heard that. But that cannot be what Jesus means here. Because he tells the disciples to learn this lesson. And nobody could have learned the lesson that was born or alive before 1948 if it specifically refers to that. And so this morning what we're going to do is look at these verses and, and I would just encourage us to, to take the simple reading of Scripture in the context that is presented. The simple reading of the Scriptures. I, I had an opportunity Thursday to speak in, in Cabot about the authority of Scripture. I've had two or three conversations this week with people uh, about different ideas they have in Scripture that just can't make, they can't possibly be true. And if you'll just simply read the Scripture and let the book say what the book says, we don't end up with all that speculation right, that, that can't possibly be what it's talking about. God, God wrote the Bible to us in words that we can understand. And so we're going to look at the simple reading of Scripture. You may feel like if you've read a bunch of other examples about these verses that maybe I'm oversimplifying it, but I believe this is the simple reading of these scriptures in their context. And so he says, from the fig tree, learn its lesson. Its lesson. So he's teaching them something, using the fig tree as an analogy, something they can understand. What is the purpose of parables? It's to further explain things that have already been taught. We've seen that all through Matthew when parables come up. So this is about something he's already told them about. It can't be about something that's going to happen way, way, way after they're gone. Right? So it's something he's already taught them about. That's the purpose of parables. And he says, as soon as its branch becomes tender and puts out leaves, you know that summer's near. Well, that's pretty simple, right? We, we should understand that. When a tree puts on new growth and it's starting to bud and the branches get tender, what time of the year is that? That's spring. And what's after spring? Summer, right? We know that. We, we know that right now, this time of year, if you go out and look at fruit trees and, 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 and even non fruiting trees, they have new branches that are the tender new branches and the little buds they're putting on. And, and when that starts to happen, we know that summer is right around the corner. Now, this is kind of interesting because this year we kind of had a, a little trick happen, right? <laughs> We had a little trick happen where like the mulberry tree in our backyard started to bud and almost start to grow mulberries then it froze again and they all died and it had to start over and so that's the idea once this new growth starts to happen and, and it's sustainable we know hey this is springtime we're going to get a harvest now because this new growth's coming there's going to be a harvest and so he says, as the branch becomes tender and puts on its leaves, you know that there's going to be summer coming and, and summer is going to bring a harvest. We understand that, right? The way that the new growth works and you can see those tender branches and, and really those are the ones that you propagate. If you want to cut off and root something, you get those new tender branches, right? That's what he's talking about. This new growth that comes on trees in the spring. But that new growth indicate something. That means that that tree is still alive. It's still fruitful. That means there's going to be a harvest. You're going to be able to get fruit off of that thing. That's the analogy. That's the example he uses. Summer is going to be near. <clears throat> he 
He says it puts on leaves. You know, summer's near. Summer's synonymous with the harvest. And so it brings about fruit. There's going to be a time of harvest. And what does that mean, though? Well, the harvest, he's already talked about over and over and over again, is the end of the age, this judgment that's coming. Matthew 13. Matthew 13, when he's separate, when he's explaining the, the parable of the wheat and the weeds, he says, Matthew 13, 36 through 43, he left the crowds, he went into the house, his disciples came to him saying, explain to us the parable of the weeds of the field. And he answered, the one who sows the good seed is the son of man, the field is the world, and the good seed is the sons of the kingdom. The weeds are the sons of the evil one. The enemy who sowed them is the devil. The harvest is the end of the age, and the reapers are angels. Just as weeds are gathered and burned with fire, so will it be at the end of the age. The Son of Man will send his angels, and they will gather out of his kingdom all causes of sin and all lawbreakers, and throw them into the fiery furnace. In that place there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. And the righteous will shine like the sun in the kingdom of their father. He who has ears, let him hear. And so he's already taught over and over again this idea of the harvest and, and what the harvest time represents. And, and then now he's talking about the end of the age. And he says, well, you know, when you see uh, new growth and new branches and, and new leaves and buds on a fig tree, you know that means that there's going to be a harvest soon. And so he's connecting this. He's explaining this. That's what the whole chapter has been about. It's the end of the age, chapter 24. And he gives us... Uh, and remember in verse 3 what are they asking about when he gives them this parable of the fig tree what are they asking about tell us when will these things be what will be the sign of your coming and the end of the age so that's what he's talking about here this is a parable about the end of the age and it's a very simple analogy and it says when you see the leaves you know that spring that means there's going to be summer that means there's going to be a harvest and you would perceive then the harvest is the second coming because he talked about that in Matthew 13. It's the coming of God's judgment. They would have easily understood what he's saying. It's not complicated. Now, if it's about all these things that hadn't happened yet in their lifetime, they would have not understood what he was saying at all. But they would have easily understood this, this analogy and this example of the harvest and, and what that meant. And he said in verse 6 through 14 of 24, remember, it's not a complicated analogy. He said there's going to be signs. What are the signs? You will hear of wars and rumors of wars. See that you're not alarmed, for this must take place, but the end's not yet. For nation will rise against nation and kingdom against kingdom, and there will be famines and earthquakes in various places. All these are but the beginning of the birth pains. Then they'll deliver you up to tribulation and put you to death. And you'll be hated by all nations for my name's sake. And then many will fall away and betray one another and hate one another. And many false prophets will arise and lead many astray. And because lawlessness will be increased, the love of many will go cold. But the one who endures to the end will be saved. And this gospel of the kingdom will be proclaimed throughout the whole world as a testimony to all nations. And then the end will come. Verse 15, he said, So when you see... The abomination of desolation spoken of by the prophet Daniel standing in the holy place. You're going to see this. And then you need to flee. You need to run. And he says his return is going to be big and it's a public event. Verses 27 and 28. For the light, uh, for as the lightning comes from the east and shines as far as the west, so will be the coming of the Son of Man. Wherever the corpse is, there the vultures gather. He's used these other, uh, already these other uh, times through this chapter when he said, when you see this, when you see this, when you see this, talking about spiritual things, and now he uses this analogy, a uh, parable, and says, like when you see new growth on a fig tree, you know what's coming. He's been telling them, when you see all these things, you can know that the end is here, it's coming. And so he's told them all of that. And then last week we read, verses 29 through 31, Immediately after the tribulation of those days, the sun will be darkened and the moon will not give its light and the stars will fall from heaven and the powers of the heavens will be shaken. Then will appear in heaven the sign of the Son of Man and all the tribes of the earth will mourn and they will see the Son of Man coming on the clouds of heaven with power and great glory. And he'll send out his angels with a loud trumpet call and they'll gather his elect from the four winds from one end of heaven 
to the other. And so today, Jesus basically has told them all of that. The birth pains, the abomination, the great tribulation unlike any other time, this, this heaven fin shaking and the stars falling and the Son of Man appearing <coughs> on the clouds. He's told them all of that. And then it's kind of like he turned to them and said, it's just like this. It's just like a fig tree. Learn this lesson. As its branch becomes tender and puts out leaves, you know summer's near. And that's what he's saying. You know that this means this. And he's been telling them that through the whole chapter. Today, we may use a similar analogy. Okay? If we were talking about, uh, if it was modern day Arkansas, that Jesus was giving this analogy, he maybe wouldn't have used a fig tree to talk about a, a harvest of, of produce. He maybe have used a dogwood tree to talk about a harvest of crappies. Right? <laughs> but if you've been around fishermen or you're much of one at all, and you've heard fishermen say that. When the dogwoods are blooming, you know it's time to go fishing, right? And that's kind of that example. He's saying when you see the fig bloom, you know there's going to be a harvest. When you see all these things happen, you know that the end of the age is here. It's coming. That's the example he's used. And then he gives them the application. He tells them that's what he means by that parable. I think it's, a, it's wild to me growing up that that I heard so many times from different places or, or different books or different things I've watched online where people will say, oh no, verse 32 is about Israel and, and uh, being a, they were gaining their statehood in 1948. But in verse 33, Jesus says what it's about. So also, so what does that mean? That means I just talked about the fig tree and just like that, so also, when you see all these things, you know that he is near at the very gates. All what things? All the things we've read since verse 4 when he starts answering the question. Deception, wars, rumors of wars, pestilences, earthquakes, the abomination of desolation spoken of by the prophet Daniel, the heavens being shaken, all these things. You know the harvest is coming. When you see all these things, you know that he's near at the very gates. Some of your translations say you may know that it's near. Uh, King James says it's near. But the idea is that the kingdom, Christ's kingdom, that millennial kingdom is near. That's what he says. And so just like the tree putting on new growth, you know harvest is coming. When you see all these things he's been talking about in chapter 24, you know that he's near. That, that Christ's near. He's, he's coming. He's at, at the very gates. The kingdom is at hand. Amen. And Christ is going to come back. The harvest is coming. Matthew 13 says, Just as the weeds are gathered and burned with fire, so will it be at the end of the age. The Son of Man will send his angels and gather out of his kingdom all cause of sin and all lawbreakers and throw them into the fiery furnace in that place where there is weeping and gnashing of teeth. And the righteous will shine like the sun in the kingdom of their Father. And Jesus says in Matthew 24, what we're looking at today, when you see all that stuff I've talked about since verse 4, in verse 32 and 33, he says, when you see all that, it's time. It's near. The kingdom's next. Because that's what they ask. What's the sign of your coming and you establishing your kingdom? Well, all these things are going to lead up to my second coming. And when that happens, I'm setting up the kingdom. It's here. It's at the gates. The gates of the kingdom are right on the brink is kind of the idea. Immediately, verse 29 through 31, so kind of putting together from last week to this week. Immediately after tribulation, the sun will be darkened, the moon will not give its light, the stars will fall from heaven, the powers of heaven will be shaken, then will appear in heaven the sign of the Son of Man, and all the tribes of the earth will mourn, and they'll see the Son of Man coming on the clouds of heaven with power and great glory. And he'll send out his angels with a loud trumpet call, and they will gather his elect from the four winds from one end of heaven to the other. And then he gives the analogy in verse 32. And in verse 33, he says, when you see all these things, you know he's near at the very gates. Luke worded it this way. We read last week. Now when these things take place, straighten up, raise your heads, because your redemption is drawing near. That's what he's telling them. It's not a super complicated passage. The simple reading of Scripture in its context makes really clear sense when you see all these things. 
So I think verses 32 and 33 are, are fairly straightforward. But verse 34, a whole other set of questions comes out. Verse 34, Matthew 24, Truly I say to you, this generation will not pass away till all these things take place. And the question everybody wants to know all the time, and there's all kinds of opinions about it, what generation? This generation won't pass away until all these things take place. What generation? Well, some people try to say that Jesus was talking about the disciples. And those same people, some of them, say that he was talking about the disciples, he just got it wrong. That creates a lot of problems. Yeah. And then some people try to explain it in a lot of even, even weirder ways, but that he was talking about the disciples and specifically 70 AD and that they lived and saw that at that point we said a while ago. That can't be because 70 AD was when Rome came, not when Christ came. And so that, that can't be it. There's a lot of other opinions out there. Uh, most of them don't make sense when we look at the context of these verses. <coughs> Jesus has given them a parable, the lesson of the fig tree. The purpose is to clarify what he's been telling them in chapter 24. He's not trying to say something to them. It's some obscure thing they couldn't have understood. It's in 70 AD or in 1948 or any of that. They couldn't have understood that. But he says, learn this. He's just kind of wrapping up everything he talked about in the rest of the chapter. He gave them specifics about what they're going to see. But now he says, when you see these things, you know it's near. When you see these things, you know it's near. And so the connection then between the parable and the application is, is when you see the heavens shaken and the birth pains and the abomination of desolation, when you see all that, judgment is near, the end of the age is near, and truly I say to you, this generation will not pass away until all these things take place. So what generation? The most simple reading of the text, the logical answer is the generation that sees those things take place. The generation that sees those things start to take place, those are the same generation of people that are going to be alive when Christ returns. Amen. That's the idea. Right? It'd be really weird because it meant something else, because all the analogies are short term analogies. Birth pains. Right? If you are around for the birth pains of a baby being born, Chances are you're going to be around for the birth of that baby, right? If you're around for the, the blooming of, of new growth in the spring, chances are you're going to be around in the summer when you get that harvest. And so that's the idea. He says this generation will not pass away until they see these things take place. The disciples want to know how long is it going to take? That's the question. Once it starts, how long is it going to take? What's the sign of your coming and the end of the age? When are you going to set up your kingdom? Once all this starts, how long is it going to take? Jesus basically tells them, not long. Not long, just like a bloom on a fig to a harvest of a fig is not long. Just like the starting of birth pains to the birth of a baby is not long. How long is it going to take? Not long. The generation that's alive during the time that those things start to take place will not all die off. They'll, that same generation will be around when it comes to completion. That's what he's saying. The generation that sees the birth pains will see the birth, the birth. The generation that sees the new growth will see the harvest. The generation that's alive at that time and sees those things will still be around until it's all accomplished. And so basically he's telling them when it comes, it's going to come fast. When it starts to unravel, it's going to be quick. And we know that. We know it's going to be seven years, two time periods of three and a half years. But he's telling them that it's going to happen quickly. It's going to unravel pretty fast. Especially in the big scheme of things throughout the rest of the history of the world, right? It's going to happen quickly. That's what he says. In Revelation, we've seen that. Daniel, we've seen that. That there's a period of seven years and that it's two halves, three and a half years. And the abomination of desolation happens and then there's three and a half years where the Antichrist is in control that is called the Great Tribulation. And the generation that's alive when that stuff's going on, some of them are still going to be around when it ends. That's all he's saying. I don't mean to say that's all he's saying like it's a cheap thing, but it's not some 
some impossible thing to understand. He's answering the question they ask. Sometimes when we interpret scripture, we have a tendency to try to make Jesus answer questions that nobody asked him. But he's answering the question that they asked him. When is it going to happen? How are these things going to take place? What is the sign of this? And he's explained it through this whole chapter. And he says, and when you see all that, no, it's really close. It's really close. And so if you go back to verse 15, the abomination of desolation, when you see that, he says, run. Why? Because verse 21, the great tribulation is going to be a time that has not been from the beginning of the world until now, and no, never will be. And he says it's going to be ended by the sign of the Son of Man in heaven, and immediately after the three and a half years of the Antichrist, the sky begins to fall, and the Son of Man appears, and he's ready to establish his kingdom. That's what he said. That's what we've seen down through verse 31. And today in verses 32 through 35, we're looking at Jesus explaining the specifics of that, the end of that. Those who see these things will also see the end. That is the clearest and simplest understanding of these verses read in their context. And so it just refers to people that will be there during that time when it kicks off. And some people say, well, well, what if you believe different things about when the rapture is going to happen? Well, that doesn't change anything about these verses because Jesus doesn't talk about the rapture at all in this chapter. If you're pre-trib or if maybe you lean like I do towards a mid-trib or maybe you even lean post-trib, none of that changes what Jesus is saying because he doesn't mention the rapture. This is about his second coming and the end of the age and establishing the kingdom. So even if you're pre-trib and you say, well, everybody's going to be raptured before that. Well, all the believers would be, but there's going to be non-believers still here. And that generation is going to see those things happen and they'll still be around when it ends. But either way, the 144,000, Revelation 7 tells us, there'll be 144,000 Jews that are saved during the tribulation that are going to be incredible witnesses all over the world. And so even if, you're, if you lean towards a pre-trib rapture, it's clear there's going to be people that are witnessing, and so there's going to be people that are saved during the tribulation that will see these things unfolding. And that's what he's saying. Those who see these things, that same generation will still be in existence and see the end of it. That doesn't mean that nobody in that generation is going to die. That doesn't mean that nobody in that generation is not going to see the whole thing. But we know a generation is this, this group of people. And some of those people will still be around. This, this generation of people. <coughs> and so we'll look at verse 35 and try to tie this up. Verse 35, he says, Heaven and earth will pass away, but my words will not pass away. And so the first thing he says, again, this is kind of the, the period at the, or the exclamation point at the end of all this stuff he's been talking about. Because it's, it's really a lot of, uh, what's the word I'm looking for? Um, just, I can't think of a good word. Catastrophic, that's the word. A lot of catastrophic things. You're talking about wars and rivers of wars all over the earth and earthquakes and pestilences and, and, and the sky falling and, and all of that kind of stuff. We read last week Colossians 1, 16 and 17. For by him all things were created in heaven and on earth, visible and invisible, through the thrones or dominions or rulers or authorities. All things were created through him and for him, and he's before all things, and in him all things hold together. Hebrews 1 3, he's the radiance of the glory of God, the exact imprint of his nature, and he upholds the universe by the word of his power. But we read last week, after the tribulation, Jesus says he's going to essentially let go of those things he's been holding together. And the sun's going to go wild, and the moon's going to go wild, and the stars are going to fall, and the heavens are going to be shaken. That's, that's really a lot of catastrophic stuff. That's some scary stuff that he's been talking about. And he says that stuff's going to happen. Heaven and earth will pass away. It's going to happen. That's an that's a exclamation point, period, done. Heaven and earth will pass away. That's right. And we've looked at some of that. And the reality is that heaven and earth will end as we know it. It's going to come to an end. We've looked at a lot of 
passages about the end times in Daniel and some of Revelation and here in Matthew 24. But we also know that the Bible tells us, I hope we know, I assume most of us know, that we also have a promise that there's going to be a new heaven and a new earth. But Jesus is affirming for them, yeah, all these terrible things are going to happen. This isn't hyperbolic language. There are some people who believe that, that everything Jesus said in Matthew 24 was actually about 70 AD and 1948, and, and it was really all her, 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 her hyperbole. He was just using really exaggerated language. But this statement means, no, he's not. He says, certainly, without a doubt, heaven and earth will pass away. I'm not being dramatic. This isn't hyperbole. He says it's going to happen. Heaven and earth will pass away. And the specifics of that, I don't know that we can understand what that is going to look like specifically unless we're the ones who see it. But he says it's going to happen. So he's affirming that with the disciples. This is going to happen. Heaven and earth are going to pass away. There's going to be a lot of things change. There's going to be a lot of cat uh, catastrophe happen. But then we know there's a new creation. A lot of things are going to change for eternity. But then there's this other reassuring statement at the end of verse 35. There's one thing that's never going to change. And that's kind of what he's saying. I think that's the simplest reading of this. All this terrible stuff that we've been kind of just trucking through for weeks that seem almost depressing if you don't know any better. But it comes at the end of verse 35, there's a, a reassuring statement. Yeah, heaven and earth are going to pass away, but one thing that's never going to change, he says, but my words will not pass away. Mm -hmm. He's letting them know his authority is eternal. Don't think that because all this stuff's happening, don't think that because the universe starts to fall apart and start, don't think that means that I'm not still in charge. That's what he's saying. Don't think that that means that God's not still sovereign. Don't think that bad things mean that God's not still on his throne. No, he is. And that's what he says. Heaven and earth are going to pass away. All this terrible stuff's going to happen at the end of the age. In our life today, there are bad things that happen in my life or your life or things we just don't understand. But remember, that doesn't change anything about the fact that his word does not pass away. He has eternal authority and he always has had it and he always will have it. And so that's what he's telling them. Everything about the end of the age, it's going to happen. Things are going to get wild. There's going to be a time of great tribulation like it's never been before and never will be again. And then everything's going to go crazy in the sky. It's going to get dark and the moon's not going to shine. And stars are going to fall. And all this crazy stuff's going to happen. Heaven and earth will pass away. But one thing that's never going to change is that he's in charge, that he is sovereign, and that he has all authority. And think about if you're them hearing all this for the first time. you got to be thinking to yourself, well, can't, can't you, Jesus, can't you stop all that? That sounds really scary, Jesus. Can't you do something about that? And he reminds them that he's in charge of the whole thing. That he has authority over the whole thing. It doesn't matter how bad it gets. He has unchanging eternal authority. <coughs> Not just during tribulation, not just at the end of the age, but forever and always and right now, his word will not pass away. And so the question this morning, I know I even told Brother Kevin before church, I said, I feel weird coming to these verses. And from my perspective, I feel like this is kind of one of those, I don't mean this the wrong way, I'll take it the wrong way. But it kind of feels like when I was writing it, a boring sermon. Not that I would ever preach a boring sermon. <laughs> but I think it's because I, I read so many things this week and, and, and studying this chapter, so many wild ideas out there that really do seem a whole lot more exciting about these verses than just this simple reading of the verses. But we don't want to take something that's not there and, and try to put it in there. We don't, want to, we don't want to say that Jesus is answering a question that nobody even asked him. Uh, he, he's answering their question about when is this going to be? How long is it going to take? He says, well, it's going to be pretty quick when you see these things that's coming, just like the fig tree that blooms. And the, it's going to happen pretty quick because the people who see it are going to see the end of it. That's what he's telling them. So all that, understanding the simple reading of these verses, 
The question I have then this morning really is, are you ready for that? Well, are you ready to stand before a God who has eternal authority forever and always? Are you ready to stand before the God of the universe who is able to uphold the universe for as long as he pleases and let go of it whenever he pleases? Are you ready to stand before a God whose words will never pass away? That's not just me being, you know, preachery or, or, or trying to be dramatic. That's this serious stuff. It's serious stuff. Are you ready to stand before the God of the universe who holds the universe together by his words and can let it go whenever he wants and his words never pass away? Are you going to be a part of the, those who are uh, really in the middle of the disaster and they're mourning and weeping because their judgment is drawing you? Or Jesus said at the end of the age that they're, the weeds are gathered and thrown and, and those are those who are not saved that they're thrown to the fiery furnace and that place where there's weeping and gnashing of teeth. Is, is that where you would be right now if it happened right now? Or would you be those who shine like the sun in the kingdom of their father? You're going to be a part of the glory at the end of the age. And the answer, the, or the reality is, the answer to that question is up to you. That's a choice that you can make. You can either reject Christ or you can accept him and submit to him as Lord and be one of those who shines in the kingdom of their father. At the end of the age. Are you going to be able to straighten up. Raise your head because your redemption draws near. Are you one of those that Paul told Titus and Titus 2. Are you able to truly say in your heart of hearts. That you're truly and genuinely waiting for our blessed hope. The appearing of the glory of our great God and Savior Jesus Christ. Is that you? Can you really say that? Or do you just tell people that you're waiting for that hope? Can you really say in your heart of hearts that you're certain that you're waiting for that blessed hope, the appearing of the glory of our great God and Savior Jesus Christ? Romans 10, 8 through 11. I want to read this to you before we close. Jesus just told us in Matthew 24, his word will never pass away. Romans 10, 8 through 11. What does it say? The word is near you, in your mouth, and in your heart. That it is the word of faith that we, we proclaim. Because if you confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. Amen. For with the heart one believes and is justified, and with the mouth one confesses and is saved. For the scripture says, everyone who believes in him will not be put to shame. Amen. That's what his word says. And he said that heaven and earth will pass away, but his word will not pass away. Are you going to trust in his word? Or not? Are you going to believe in the Word made flesh? Or are you going to reject it? This morning, whether you're here or you're listening to this somewhere else or some other time, I'd be happy to talk with you today. We're going to have a moment of invitation. But if you don't, you can stay after. After the invitation's over, everybody else leaves. I will hang out here as long as I have to to talk to you about that, and you can know that you have that hope and that appearing of Christ our Savior. I promise you. My family, my sister-in-law, they do not want me anywhere near them today where they're having that baby. Adrian and the Bills can go do that, and I'll stay and talk with you. Uh, let's pray. Dear God, we come before you. I want to thank you first and foremost again for who you are. Lord, I, I pray that you'd help us today as we look at your word to, to understand the authority of your word, but also, Lord, to understand really the, the, the simplicity of your word. That you have spoken to us clearly and communicated to us your word in the scriptures in such a way that we can understand it. And Lord, I pray that you give each of us a desire to, to do that, to study your word, to, to, to seek to understand your word on our own, not to be, uh, honestly, not to be deceived into to thinking that we're not able to understand it, but that we would sit down and read your word the simple reading of your word through the work of your Holy Spirit, we would understand it, we, we would hold it dear and near to our hearts, and then we would understand that, that it's eternal, it's eternally authoritative, it never passes away. God, I pray for anyone listening to the message today that's, that's never trusted in Christ, that, that doesn't know what it means 
to have a hope in the appearing of, of your son that, that doesn't understand what it means to stand before a holy and righteous God that upholds the universe, that you'd give them conviction of their sin, they'd be confronted with the reality that, that there's, a, there's a harvest coming, that there is a judgment coming, it's certain, and that they would be drawn to reconcile through your son with you before that time. We pray these things in his name.